<clears throat> but how do we get, Antoine asked me, how do we get from behavioral freedom in fruit flies and bacteria, which he claims, and I agree, up to a free will in humans? Well, whether in biological evolution or in generating possibilities for this two-stage model, where does the randomness come from? The answer is the spontaneous variations all come from some indeterminism, from what Martin calls objective chance, from quantum randomness. In the end, that's the one that breaks the chain of causal determinism. But the difference between the behavioral freedom at the lower animal and the higher is the method of selection that makes the difference. In biological evolution, it's nature that selects. But in behavioral freedom it, and all of life, the organism itself purposefully and intentionally selects. And Dan Dennett is very big, and many of us, Al, Al, on intentionality. What is it to form an intention? This goes on in an organism because as soon as life came onto the planet, so came teleonomy. Not teleology, perhaps, back to a, an ultimate purpose, but I think the cosmos has a kind of uh, direction, at least, that I'll talk to you about. So, uh, my response to Antoine is to identify four levels oops, of selection. First, the kind of simplest instinctive selection, where selection criteria are transmitted genetically, shaped only by our ancestral experiences or the animal's ancestral experience. Uh, at, a, at a second level, there are animals who learn something, uh, where their past experiences guide their current choices. Uh, so their selection criteria are acquired during their lifetimes. Then I'd like to say there seems to me to come a level of evolution in which the organism is able to predict the future and see the consequences of its actions and help to decide based on what they've seen before and what this is likely to lead to. And finally, I kind of get to a level which I feel is human, but there are many of my colleagues at Harvard who say this is in the moral animals and there are lots of them too. And these are, this I call reflective, a kind of um, reflective endorsement of Christine Korsgaard. Uh, or normative selection where our conscious deliberation includes the values of our tribe, our community, or whatever in influencing the choice of our behaviors. Okay, so how would I compare my model to the three other major people who've written about it? My model is just Dennett's model, but unlike him, I can't count on the computer randomness as much as he's an AI character. I want true quantum randomness involved. Kane has long held that quantum randomness is needed, but my model wants to put chance back into the early stage and not in the decision, where Bob has a very important reason for putting it in the decision for, for reason of character formation and other issues he'll talk to you about. I agree completely with Mealy's view, except I want to say to him, Al, determinism is just plain false. And today I'm going to give you a second reason other than indeterminism why you could tell your students Determinism just doesn't work in the, in the universe. So I'm going to give you, I hope, a second reason. And none of these thinkers has located the time and place of the source of quantum randomness in the mind, in the brain, as I do. And so that's a very important difference. So what's better? The previous thinkers almost always thought they needed a single quantum event located somewhere in the brain, which is amplified up, pops into the decision, and makes it free. Doesn't work. Uh, you would lose, as Al says, agent control. You'd lose responsibility, except for Bob Kane's uh, torn decisions, which we'll come to. My model does not rely on a single quantum event for each will decision. That would make the decision random. The source of randomness in my model is, as Martin t told us yesterday, that there are fundamentally noise uh, and quantal and maybe more classical thermal noise, oh, I question this, that affects the creation, the storage, the maintenance and retrieval of information in any information processing system. That includes computers, which have noise in them, but Dan Dennett's hasn't noticed in some way that the noise in a computer is always suppressed by fantastic error detection and correction mechanisms. And I'd like to argue that biological systems have long ago learned how to cope with noise, suppress it when they don't need it, but then use it when they find it advantageous and adding to their uh, success. So the source of the break in the causal deterministic chain, uh, I want to say, doesn't have to happen in the mind. It could have been an external random event that led you to your new idea. It needn't even happen during deliberation. Philosophers think, oh, I have to access the randomness now in order for this event to be disconnected from predetermination. No, it could be something you thought about 20 years earlier and never acted on. Now you suddenly say, oh, that was a good idea, and you decide to do it and bring it into the world. Five it could act. Mm -hmm. Five minutes. 
Okay, it could result from a mistaken perception or an error during consolidation of memory. Now come to my second part <laughs> in five minutes. My question, where does the information come from in the universe? How can we having this conversation? Uh, and the answer is because we and the universe are creative. We create new information using what I call cosmic information process, which involves in interaction of quantum physics. There are two things with thermodynamics. We must have a microscopic quantum event that lowers the entropy locally, and then an energy and entropy transfer away from the new information structure. I'll jump in to show you a specific example. Imagine a hydrogen atom is being formed. We take a proton and an electron, we form the atom. Not unless, however, the photon, the binding energy, is released carrying away entropy. Because if that entropy isn't carried away, uh, it would just go back and disassociate, okay? So uh, whether it's a new particle like a hydrogen atom or a bit set or reset in a digital computer, uh, the next nucleotide in a DNA strand or a new idea in our minds, two irreversible things must happen. An undetermined quantum event followed by transfer of entropy away uh, from uh, the situation. What's the connection between entropy and information? Leo Szilard in 1939 showed that Maxwell's demon must gather information in order to decrease the entropy. That's for a technical point. And then Gunter Ludwig wrote an article in Zeitschrift for Physique in 1953 connecting en entropy to measure and process. And of course, IBM's Rolf Landauer, who was a mentor of Charles Bennett and uh, uh, worked, who did quantum cryptography with Gilles, uh, showed that even in a computer to set a bit or reset a bit, you must uh, have the computer must absorb entropy. But how, here's my question, how can information good negative entropy possibly increase at the same time the bad entropy increases. And here I remind you, many of you have spoken today about Laplace demon. In a Laplace demon model, the universe is completely all a scene at all times, you know, like the eyes of God seeing all times, because information is a constant of nature. Here's time, here's information in the blue line. This is an idea that mathematical physicists still mistakenly have. In the mid 19th century, uh, Lord Kelvin, William Thompson, uh, noticed the laws of thermodynamics and said, oh my goodness, information is being lost. Here it is, getting, turning into entropy. And obviously over time, Helmholtz would call it a heat death of the universe. Although mathematicians would say that all this lost information could be recovered if you could have microscopic reversibility. Now here's my view of the universe, and this is a radical change in how it is we think about things. The universe, in fact, did start, as they told me in the 50s, in a state of equilibrium with no, virtually no information, just macroscopic. And it's grown ever since, and that's made it possible for information structures to grow. So we now have two reasons to reject determinism. The old reason was microscopic <coughs> physics is indeterministic. The new reason is that Macroscopic cosmology says there wasn't enough information in the past, none at all in the early universe to determine the present. The future is open. It's our job to recreate it. I guess I'm not going to have time to talk about Ludwig Boltzmann and his criticisms, because uh, I my, come to my website to show you uh, that there's no eternal return of the same, of uh, the Nietzsche idea, and there's no microscopic reversibility. If you look at it in the entangled atoms and the quantum uh, state they're in when they're in a molecular, and I also would like to say something, a word about the problem of measurement, which is connected to these two issues, and uh, get to the subject of what Werner Heisenberg called the uh, cut or the schnitt, and what John Bell called, Bell called the shifty split. He said, where the heck does this happen? Is it happening here with a photographic plate or with a human or a brain or a mind or maybe a mind that has a PhD? And my answer is, it happens right here because at the moment the silver atoms precipitate in the gel, their information has entered the universe and it's now observable. And it doesn't need an observer to have happened. And so uh, I will close, not time, but maybe during the discussion, how Ch Dennett has challenged me to give him a reason why quantum indeterminacy would be better than, quantum ra than pseudo randomness. And I've given him four cases and he's accepted one. The first we've just shown, I believe this work kills Laplace's demon. He doesn't exist, we shouldn't worry about him anymore. There's no determinism and we really could go on. Uh, I've given him a discussion of an intelligent designer and the Frankfurt controllers that Bob Kane also showed doesn't, don't exist. 
Uh, and finally, though, I have one I call Dennett's eavesdropper that should be of great interest, I hope, to those of you in the entanglement field, because he says he agrees that if he was sending a message to someone, he wouldn't want to use a computer-generated randomness because somebody might reverse engineer the algorithm and figure out what he said. And there he says he thinks quantum indeterminism is preferable when we communicate with one another. And I said to him, well, what about when we communicate with ourselves in our own mind? And so why am I an information philosopher? And this is for John Stone. Because information is neither matter nor energy. It needs matter for its embodiment. It needs energy for its communication. But I think of the information that's the basis of my philosophy as something immaterial, as close as scientists could say to a spirit. It's the mind and the body, the ghost in the machine, the soul and the flesh. And when we die, as Antoine is asking, it's your information that goes. Your matter just decays, but the information is gone. So this, <laughs> the question, is science compatible with freedom? No, free will, is, uh, not, uh, free will is incompatible with predeterminism and with any indeterminism in the choice itself, itself except for Bob Kane. But I say that it is compatible with my form of limited indeterminism, where it's kept only in generating your new ideas, which solves the problem of creativity, and with a limited but adequate determinism. And I like to say, David Hume reconciled freedom with determinism. I hope to be remembered as reconciling free will with true quantum randomness and indeterminism. Thank you very much. Thank you.